Hi, everybody. My name is Becky Tharp, and um, I'm with the Green Infrastructure Collaborative. We're a project of the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation and the Lake Champlain Sea Grant Program at UVM. And um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about rain gardens. And I really love doing this presentation for Master Gardeners every year. Um, I am an alumna of the Master Gardener Program from 2009. Uh, so I certainly know the volume of information you all take in over the course of this time. And uh, I can tell you, I certainly do not remember all that I learned during the Master Gardener course. And I don't expect that all of you will either. But I do think that one of the best things that I got out of it was that I was aware of a lot of things that I wasn't aware of before taking the course. And I knew where to look for more information to get resources and who I could tap into if I ever needed some of that specific info. And I hope that, at the very least, that's what you'll get tonight. You'll sort of know more about rain gardens. And if you do intend to install one, you know exactly where to go to get the information you need. So I'm going to talk tonight a little bit about uh, rain gardens. And I also um, want to just step back a little bit and tell you, since the title of the program that I work for is the Green Infrastructure Collaborative. Um, just to define that a little bit for those of you who may not be aware, that green infrastructure is an approach to water management whose goal is to protect, restore, or mimic the natural water cycle. And rain gardens are one tool that can be used for this purpose. And tonight, we're just going to focus really on that tool mostly. So I'm going to go over some of the basics about what is a rain garden, just definition-wise. And then I'll talk about why we would use rain gardens. Um, and the most important information there is what are the impacts of development that we need to be aware of and what calls for a rain garden to be installed. And then I'll get into the nitty-gritty about rain garden design and installation and what you need to know. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit at the end about rain barrels and how they can be used to store rainwater for use in the garden or for use right in your uh, rain garden. I will stop throughout for questions. We don't have to wait till the end. So if you have questions, you could just throw them up um, on the screen and type them in. Um, and then if I see a couple um, that will pop up there, then uh, Heather can walk us through um, answering those questions. So don't be shy. If, so, if something doesn't make sense or I didn't cover anything in enough detail, please be sure just to put your question out there. So. For starters, let's see, that's not clicking. Looks like my screen is a little bit frozen. Oh, there it goes, perfect. So, uh, what are rain gardens? So, rain gardens are depressed areas that are filled with plants. And the plants in rain gardens are tolerant to inundation and to periods of drought. Because in a rain garden, sometimes you'll have a lot of runoff that will flow into them and might fill up the depressed area. But then you may have periods in the middle of the summer where you wouldn't get any uh, runoff. And so the plants need to be tolerant to both of those conditions. The important thing about rain gardens, too, is that they aren't just depressed areas, but runoff is also directed into the garden so that it encourages infiltration and discourages runoff of water to other places other than the garden. Other places meaning into streams or into storm grates on the road. So they're functional gardens that can look beautiful but also do this workhorse job of infiltrating um, water and getting it off of uh, and out of our streams. So why would we want a rain garden? So rain gardens, like I said, hold and infiltrate stormwater runoff. And stormwater runoff is just the water that runs off a landscape instead of soaking in. So anything that falls on your rooftop or your driveway or even your lawn in many cases because those can be compacted areas of soil. They filter the water as the water moves down through the layers of soil that you put into the rain garden. They add beauty and habitat like many gardens do. But here's the thing that sort of separates them from other gardens, is that there's a real um, focus on protecting water quality in the watershed. And that is by reducing the pollutants that are held in stormwater and also the volume of the stormwater, which can be problematic for aquatic organisms. Another added benefit is that it can increase groundwater recharge rates, which mimic a site's natural hydrology. And that sort of gets back to what green infrastructure is overall as an approach to water management. The goal there being that you're mimicking a site's natural hydrology where there's some infiltration happening and it isn't just all surface runoff. 
So why is that um, all that important? Why do we want to do those things? So in the past, our main pollution concern was point source pollution, and those are the sources of pollutants that you can really point to the end of a pipe or a particular factory or one location on the landscape um, that you can identify where the pollution is coming from. And as a result of the Clean Water Act in the 1970s, much of that pollution source type was managed. Um, we don't see our highest pollution rates coming from point sources anymore. Currently, our most pressing pollution concern is what's called non-point source pollution. And just like the name suggests, there isn't one location that you can point to and say, ah, yes, that's where all that pollutant is coming from. It's really coming from across the landscape, from all of our driveways, from all of our um, gardens, from all of our lawns, from all of our farms. And it's much more challenging to address because you can't just put a maximum outlet on a pipe. It's really about all of us participating in the action to reduce the pollutant loading. So when we talk about rain gardens, it's also important to understand watersheds because when you build a rain garden, you're essentially creating a little sub-watershed um, on a landscape. So watersheds basically refer to all the water that collects and flows through a topographically defined region. And watersheds can be divided by ridges that direct surface flow into different streams, rivers, wetlands, lakes, and ponds. And the ridges can be, oops, the ridges can be natural, like the spine of the Green Mountains, um, or they can be man-made, like a roadside curb, or even a little swale that you would build to direct water to your rain garden. And watersheds can be any shape and size, and they can have smaller drainages nested within them. They're known as sub-watersheds. And watersheds are by nature hydrologically linked. Um, so what happens in one part of a watershed has implications on another. Um, so in Vermont, there are two, the two largest watersheds that we drain to are the Connecticut River and Lake Champlain. Um, but both of those watersheds are linked again as Lake Champlain flows north into the Richelieu River and out into the St. Lawrence and, and eventually into the Atlantic Ocean. The same is true for the outlet to the, from the Connecticut River. They both end up in the Atlantic Ocean. So we have these two sort of sub-watersheds um, within Vermont that all drain to this larger watershed in the Atlantic Basin. Um, similarly, the Lake Champlain watershed is broken up into sub-watersheds by our rivers. For instance, the Lamoille River watershed and the Winooski River, they both drain into Lake Champlain and they're nested within the Lake Champlain watershed. So this, um, when I would give this presentation when we did it in person, um, I always like to see if anybody could identify um, what that water body is. Um, if anybody does know what it is, you could just write it up on, the, on your screen in the questions box. I'd be curious to know if anyone does. Um, so this is, that's the spine of the Green Mountains there. That's at um, uh, Mansfield. And in front of it is a little lake. Let's see if anybody, no, we have no guesses. It's, it's Lake Mansfield. And Lake Man, Mansfield um, connects to Miller Brook, which runs down. Um, and that, you can see the spine of the Green Mountains, and that really defines that watershed really clearly. But then there's sort of a smaller watershed in that little um, elbow um, where Lake Mansfield sits. So all the water that falls on that ridge and on those, um, on those slopes flow right into uh, Lake Mansfield. And from Lake Mansfield, it feeds into Miller Brook. And if you follow it down, sort of coming towards the screen at you, Miller Brook, this is a, a zoomed out version, Miller Brook um, flows into Little River and into Waterbury Reservoir. And then you can see now in the far side of that image, in the background behind Mansfield, you can see Lake Champlain. And so all of that water that initially just flows into Lake Mansfield, and if you're in that location locally, you would think, oh, this is our watershed. But you're really closely linked to all of the development and all of the people and all of the animals that are on the other side of this, um, of the spine of the Green Mountains, as our sub-watersheds are disconnected, but they're connected as part of a larger watershed. And then you can see there's Stowe um, 
over in this part of the screen. Move that um, over there. I can't point to it, but you see the still resort. And this is just a great um, quote from John Thorson. Water links us to our neighbor in a way more profound and complex than any other. And I, I imagine that many of you who have neighbors know that sometimes the connection um, of water that falls on our property, on our neighbor's property, and how that flows both onto and off of our property and maybe causes damage from the road or onto the road um, can really highlight that connection um, between us and our neighbor with water. So the hydrologic cycle um, is probably, you've seen something similar to this um, many times, but this, um, I just want to highlight this so just we can sort of get back to brass tacks, I guess, about what natural hydrologic system looks like. So this kind of shows you what the pre-development hydrology of a site um, is, and I think this is really important and this really gets at the purpose of rain gardens. So just bear with me while we look at this graph for a second. So precipitation is how the water is falling down onto the landscape, and much of the water that falls in a pre-developed system, a forested, a meadow, um, in its natural state, much of it um, goes into groundwater. So you'll see this 20 to 30 percent, what's called inner flow, or you could you could call it um, shallow groundwater flow, and then. 10 to 40 percent deep, deeper groundwater flows, and less than one percent of it is surface runoff, and then you have another 40 to 50 percent that goes to evapotranspiration. So mo most of the water is either falling on leaves or being taken up by plants, which is evapotranspiring back up to be precipitated back down, and then the rest of it is going into the ground where it's either existing for a long time in deep groundwater aquifers or is slowly feeding base flow streams and rivers um, throughout the season. So you just the, there's a very, very tiny part that's actually the surface um, flow. But when humans move on to the landscape, we have a tendency to alter that cycle. We have agriculture and industry, we put up dams, we deforest the landscape, we take water out of the ground, and we urbanize. And that changes what that cycle looks like. And those alterations that we make lead to these really drastic disruptions in the shallow soils. Um, it also reduces the evaporation and transpiration due to the vegetation clearing. There's reductions in water holding capacity due to compaction of the soils and removal of topsoil. And there's also just increased surface runoff because there's more impervious cover. What was there before was a vegetated landscape where the rain was being intercepted by tree leaves and by grasses and ground cover. And now, they're, after development, it's often covered by the roofs of buildings and, um, and impervious surfaces like roads and asphalt. So it really drastically changes it. And why does that matter? What's the impact? I just have a couple of stats from Chittenden County, but this can be applied um, in, in other areas of the state. But since, from 1992 to 2006, impervious cover just in Chittenden County alone increased by 4.3 percent, so over 17,000 acres. Four percent of all streams in Chittenden County are considered impaired, so that's over 60 miles of streams, and this is, this is a little bit older data, so it's actually more than this now. And the phosphorus levels, as many of you probably know, in Lake Champlain are above limits set by the EPA. And developed land is a significant contributor to that stress on the ecosystem. So if we look at this same um, sort of schematic, but now under developed conditions, so we looked at it before when it was a forested landscape and it was the natural hydrologic conditions. Here it is under the impacts of development. And you can see that everything has changed. So whereas before we had less than 1% surface runoff, now it's more like 30% surface runoff. So that's a huge increase from what it was before. Whereas the groundwater, deep groundwater recharge was in the order of 40, 30 to 50%. Now it's around 15%. And again, the inner flow is down to 20 to 30%, whereas it was closer to, to 40%. Evapotranspiration also is much 
lower, 25% of apotranspiration. And one thing to note here is that in this, in this drawing, you also see that the water table is lowered. And this is important because what happens in our streams under these conditions is that when it rains, we have a ton of surface runoff. So the streams get a lot of water all of a sudden. And the, we, what they don't get is fed by groundwater throughout the year, which provides a much more stable base flow. Um, and that's better for aquatic organisms, but it's also better for stream stability. So you don't get these huge flows suddenly where you wipe out culverts and you take down infrastructure adjacent to streams and you gouge out the sides and you undercut in the bed of the stream. Um, so just overall, this is a bad thing for water quality, but it's also just a bad thing for human settlements near rivers. So just to recap what, what I was just saying, under urbanized conditions, we're changing all of these ratios. So instead of the, um, the 1% or less of runoff, we're up to 55%. And the, you know, these are, these are approximations. Um, but now it's only 30% of evapotranspiration instead of the 50. We're getting 10% shallow infiltration and only 5% deep infiltration. So this is it's drastically changing natural hydrology conditions. So just as an example of what that would look like over a one acre area, a one inch rainstorm over one acre in a forested landscape, and this is assuming, this makes a lot of assumptions about the slope and the soil type, but we'll pretend we're not making those assumptions. Um, um, but what that, uh, what that creates uh, in a forested landscape is under 3,000 gallons of surface runoff. But in an urban area, uh, where you've developed and put uh, rooftops and, and roadscapes is almost 15,000 gallons of water plus. So if we apply that to Burlington, um, that's 148 million gallons of water in a one-inch rainstorm that's uh, flowing over the surface. And for those of you who like to count their water uh, with Olympic sizes, <laughs> it's 225 Olympic-sized swimming pools. So it's a ton of water that flows off of the landscape that wouldn't have been flowing off of there um, in natural, uh, under natural conditions. So this is just a little bit more about the stream flashiness thing. So I talked about this um, already. I won't go into a lot of detail. But all that water that um, flows into the streams all at once causes stream flashiness, it's called. And it leads to a more destructive stream flow, eroding stream banks, loading streams with sediment and phosphorus. It's bad for water quality and habitat and people. Now to the good stuff. So this is why rain gardens um, were developed and why they've been promoted by the EPA and the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation and really across the country there's been a movement for about the past 15 years to make rain gardens and similar infrastructure like rain gardens part of um, normal stormwater practice. So rain gardens capture slow soak and filter stormwater runoff. That picture on your screen is from um, a house in the north end of Burlington, and that's a rain garden that exists right along the edge of a driveway. And you can see in the background there's a, um, a rain barrel attached to the uh, downspout of the house, which also feeds the rain garden. And I'll talk a little bit more about the design of this particular one as we go on. So before um, I go into all the nitty-gritty detail, I want to let you know that all of the information that I'm going to talk to tonight about rain gardens, um, from the design, uh, the measurement, how to test your soils, uh, how to pick plants, it can all be found in the Vermont Rain Garden Manual. It's available in PDF form for free on our website. You can find it at uvm.edu slash cgrant slash publications, and then you can just search for Vermont Rain Garden Manual. It was also recently made into an app, which is also free. You can get it in the App Store um, and is uh, with uh, Android and iPhone now. For a while, it was just iPhone, but it's available to, for both now. So if I, if I start to sort of move along and you're trying to take notes and you're thinking, I didn't catch all that, everything that I say in here you can uh, easily get afterwards if you want to build your own. So rain garden design is really related to three factors. The amount of impervious surface draining into the garden, 
what your soil type is because that tells you the infiltration capacity of the soil and the slope of the land. So those are those are really important um, and those three things really make um, all the difference when you're designing a rain garden. Those are three things you need to know. So the first step, measuring your impervious area. So the first step when you um, decide to build a rain garden is to determine where the water would be running from. Um, so let's say now you have a rooftop that you want to capture the, the, maybe the runoff now is going into a standpipe or it's pouring out onto your driveway and that driveway flows into a storm drain and that storm drain flows into a stream. Um, that would be having negative impacts on the um, on the environment. And if you wanted to build a rain garden to manage some of that flow, you would determine what the area of impervious surface it is that that garden would be collecting. And you do that by identifying the area of the roof, the driveway, the road, the patio, or any, can, um, any uh, combination of those, and you just measure them. So you measure the area by multiplying the length by the width, um, not to insult your intelligence, but just so we're all clear, that a pitch on a roof has no impact on the area, so you don't have to do any fancy trig or anything. It's just length by width, and that gives you the area that the rainwater falls on. Um, and then you have your area, so easy peasy, done. The next thing that you would do is you want to determine your soil characteristics. So you can get um, you can get real fancy and complicated with this, or you can do it, um, what I think, what I like to think of is the easy way. So the first thing to do would be to check out the Vermont a &R Natural Resources Atlas. If you haven't used this tool before, I highly recommend it for many reasons, and I think you will love it if you start to use it. You can get to it by going to anrmaps.vermont.gov slash websites slash ANRA, or just Google search Vermont ANR Atlas. It's a fantastic tool. It's an online GIS map service. So what happens is there are layers um, related to water quality and wildlife habitat and forest blocks and uh, road networks and um, house locations and any number of things, including soils. And all you do is um, similar to a Google map uh, setting, you want to center over the area that you're interested in, and then you just highlight and click um, these little boxes here uh, for the ones that you, the layers that you want to lay over onto your map, and so it looks a little something like this. And that will tell you what kind of soils you have. Now, A soils um, mean that they're really well drained, and D soils would mean that they're not very well drained. This would be like a really first pass. So the place where this data comes from is the NRCS did a soil survey of the state many years ago. Um, and so the, it's a pretty coarse uh, look at it. So in some places, you don't get a lot of um, detail, but it, it definitely is a really usable thing if you want to look in general, you know, do I have absolutely terrible soils for infiltrating or, there, or is there some hope for me? So that would be the first step. The next step is to determine your soil characteristics. So this is really like you doing your own little soil test um, on your site. So you want to go really specifically to where you think the rain garden would be or if you have a couple different locations that it could be sited in. And you, the first step would be to conduct a ribbon test. And um, the details on how to do the ribbon test you can find in the, um, uh, in the rain garden manual. But simply put, you want to take the topsoil off so you dig down four inches, take some of the material underneath the topsoil, and make sure it's sort of moist. Um, you could, if it's, if it's after a dry period, you could just even spit on it a little bit, just make sure it's got some moisture in it. Um, and put it in one hand and sort of create a ball with it. Pass it back and forth between two hands so you have a ball full of soil in your hand. And then as you pass the soil between your the knuckle of your pointer finger and your thumb, um, if you can create a ribbon that is greater than an inch and a half long, it's a good indication that you have clay soils. If you can create a ribbon but it's shorter than an inch and a half, you have a more of a silty soil. 
and if you can't really get it to clump together and it absolutely will not form a ribbon, it's falling apart, then that's an indication that you have sandy soils. It's a simplification, but it, it's a pretty accurate way to tell what kind of soils you have. Once you've done that, so you've characterized your soils, then you do a simple infiltration test. And it may sound like this is a lot of steps, but it's it's not that difficult, and it really tells you a lot, and this would be helpful probably for any gardening you would do. Um, this is a basic version of the um, infiltration test where you dig a hole, and you could dig down about six inches in a circle, um, and then you fill it with water, and then come back and check on it in 24 hours. If it drains and there's no more water left in the hole after 24 hours, it's potentially suitable for a rain garden. If there's still water sitting in the hole, then it is poor infiltration and you should look for another location. It means that water isn't moving into the uh, parent material and therefore it wouldn't do that rain garden setting. Now, one important caveat to note here is that if it has rained a lot the previous days, you could have saturated soils that, have not, that, that isn't necessarily mean that you can't have a rain garden there, so you might want to wait a, a few days to let the um, the soil not become unsaturated. And then the other thing is if it's been a very dry period, you want to just do this and then do it again the next day just to test because if it's very dry, that can sort of throw your results off a little bit. Okay. And I just, I, th I think there are a question or two have come in. So Heather, I'm going to maybe throw it over to you to Hi, Becky. a couple of questions? Yeah, actually, Hi. Uh, we just had a very spirited uh, Q&A uh, with one person in particular about <gasps> green roofs. Awesome. Um, and so, oh, I, cool. so I was answering those questions as we went, and unfortunately, I just erased them Great. all. But basically, what we were discussing, <laughs> <laughs> basically what we were discussing was um, he was asking whether green roofs count as rain gardens. And I say since they serve mm -hmm. the same function, yes, they do, but the terminology isn't used that way in the field. Um, so I can I would love to just uh, just weigh in on that. Yeah, go. So there's an there's an important um, distinction between green roofs and rain gardens, and I and it's fantastic that people are picking up on um, on green roofs because they're great um, technologies. The main difference is that green roofs don't infiltrate, right? So they would do more of the evapotranspiration part of the water cycle, whereas rain gardens are more mimicking the infiltration piece. And the reason this is important, particularly if you are in uh, a watershed that is impaired for either nitrogen or phosphorus, as Lake Champlain watershed is, and the Connecticut River watershed is impaired for nitrogen, that's important because as rain, as um, green roofs fill up, so green roofs, if you're not already familiar, they're trays of vegetation that would have a growth media, and then you'd put like a collection of sedums or some other variety on them, and it would and it captures the water so that instead of it running off of your rooftop, it fills up these trays, and then the plants would use it. Well, in many cases, if you have, you know, series of days of rain, um, those trays fill up, and then you do get runoff from the roof, but unlike runoff when you don't have a green roof, runoff with a green roof on your roof has exponentially more nutrients in it than it would if you just had a roof because you don't have soil on your roof ordinarily. There's rainwater has negligible amounts of nutrients and green roofs have lots of nutrients in them. So this is important because if you're trying to reduce the nutrient loading to a waterway, green roofs are not the best way to do that. Um, particularly if you're not then infiltrating that water in a rain garden. Can I jump in on that as well? Because actually I used to design yeah. I used to design green roofs and I taught a green cool. roof class. <laughs> um, Great. So um, in, in many cases what's done in that situation is, uh, in, and most, mostly this is in the most forward thinking type projects that would be lead projects, et cetera, is that that water is then used as gray water within the building, in which case it then can reduce the stormwater mm -hmm. runoff. So, you know, so it, it can serve that purpose. It just depends on how it's done. Mm hmm That's a great distinction. Yeah. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, but that's a great, great question. Are there any more that we should cover or are we... I, I think, I mean, we kind of went back and forth and uh, I took a few of those questions. Um, I think some of them are 
uh, really about the political climate in Burlington at this point in time and promises that uh, green roofs will uh, mitigate all stormwater issues, uh, runoff issues in downtown Burlington. Uh, and, I, and I said that that is probably not the case. So <laughs> I, I agree. I agree. <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. So we'll just move on then. All right, so after you've determined your soil characteristics with your simple infiltration test and your ribbon test and you checked out what kind of soils you have on the A&R Atlas, then, um, and everything looks good, you get, it's draining after 24 hours, you're ready to move to step three, which is determining your slope. So remember, these are the three things you need to know. The area of impervious surface draining to your garden, the infiltration capacity of your soil, and then the slope. So slope determines how deep your garden would be. So the slopier the site, the deeper the garden would need to be. And rain, this is important because rain gardens need to be level, um, which makes sense because they need to evenly distribute the water throughout the garden. If you have um, an uneven uh, bottom to your garden, then the water will pool on one end of it. And so then you'll have some very dry plants on one side and some very wet plants on the other side. So to determine your, uh, your depth, you figure out your slope. So if it's 4% or less, then the depth of the garden can be less, 3 to 5 inches. If you have a slope of 5 to 7%, then the depth of your garden would be greater, 6 to 7 inches. And an 8 to 12% uh, percent slope would give you an 8 plus inch depth garden. If you have a slope that is greater than 12 inches, you may want to reconsider doing a rain garden. Or in some cases, if you want to be sophisticated about it, you could do a terraced rain garden system, and there's some beautiful examples of that. Um, but th it's just a little bit more complicated. Um, if you want to find out what the slope of your site is, there's um, this really simple method, and you can find out all the um, all these same details in the rain garden manual. All these uh, images were taken from there. You want to um, put a stake on the uphill side and then put a stake on the downhill side. And then you run a string from the base of the uphill stake to the downhill stake. You level that string and then you measure the height from the base of the downhill stake to your string. Then you take that height, you divide it by the width, which is the distance from downhill stake to uphill stake. You times that by 100 and then you get your percent slope. So now you've done all of that work, and then you're ready to size your garden. So in order to size the garden, you need the depth that you just figured out. So remember, depth is related to the slope of your site. And then you also need to know your soil type. So you did your soil test, you have that, and then you did your slope. So you have your uh, depth of garden. And you combine those two things to get your size factor. So you pick your soil type in the left column. And then you pick your depth of your garden on the top. So that's after calculating your slope. You find your size factor number. And then you multiply your size factor times your drainage area. And remember, the drainage area is the area of the impervious surface that will drain to the garden. So if it's a rooftop, you would measure the length and width of the house, um, or if it's a driveway, similarly, length and width, you'd get square feet. And then that gives you the size of your garden. So we're going to do a little sample exercise. I want you all to humor me and play along. So if you have a house roof drainage area that is 815 square feet, and we'll assume you have silty soil, with a 3% slope, how big should your garden be? So if you guys wouldn't mind, just maybe grab a scrap of paper and see if you can figure it out. So you have 815 square feet, silty soil, 3% slope. So first you'd find your depth here, right, with your 3% slope. You take that information over here, so it's going to be in this column. Your silty soil would bring you, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Here we go. This one. Silty soil would bring you to 3, 0.34. I'm sure you're all doing great. So your size factor would be this 0.34 because your depth is 3 to 5 inches because you have a 3% slope. 
83 to 5 inches, and you have silty soil, so your size factor is 0.34. Your drainage area is the roof, which is 815 square feet. We multiply those together, and the area uh, size of our garden would be uh, 277 square feet. Okay, a little bit of math. All right, so once you have the size of your rain garden figured out, the next step is for you to design it. And this, I think, is probably the most fun part for many of you if you're interested in gardening. Now, rain gardens can really look however you like. Um, the shape can be really any organic shape um, that you want. One um, thing I would caution you on is to try and avoid um, corners if you can. Um, they, they tend to uh, be drier and the water doesn't spread as much into corners. I've certainly seen linear ones and, um, and edges that work fine, but these organic uh, swoopy sides uh, tend to be a little bit better, so if possible, do that. And also try and avoid anything um, that's a smaller angle, more acute angle um, than a 90 for those same reasons, just to, um, you don't want to inhibit the water flow. In the Rain Garden Manual, there's some really um, neat designs on the back just to get you inspired and give you some ideas for how you might lay them out. But a couple of things that you want to do is make sure you consider um, the shape, like I just said. So these are just a couple of different examples. So there's a kidney-shaped one. There's a linear one along a driveway. Um, and there's um, another linear one along a driveway that was that one that I showed you uh, early on in the presentation where of the earliest uh, slides. So this one's sort of a hybrid. It has this linear shape along the driveway, but it also, um, there's an inside curve here, and there's all this water, all this um, water from the rooftop is being collected in this rain barrel, and then the rain barrel overflow um, feeds these two sections of the garden, and then there's an inlet right here um, with some gravel that um, has water directed to the garden from the rain, from the, uh, from the driveway. So the other thing you want to consider is uh, your plants. So when selecting your plants, some really important things like with all gardens that you want to consider is how much sunlight they're going to get, how much moisture they can handle, the soil type that they prefer, height and width of the plant, the color and textures of the plants that you're, um, that you're interested in, and if they're salt tolerant. This is particularly important if you're um, taking runoff from a parking lot or a driveway where salt is applied. The Rain Garden, uh, Vermont Rain Garden Manual, if you haven't seen it already, I think that one of the best things about the manual is the really fantastic plant list um, that details all of these things. It has this big fold-out sections of plants, um, and they're broken down by shrub or if they're flower or what time they flower, if they're pollinators, if they're native, uh, if they're seasonal interest and when that is. Um, so I really encourage you to check out that as a resource. It's really, really helpful. Um, so then once you've decided what's going to be in your garden and you've laid it all out and you know what size it is and you know what depth it is, uh, then it's time to build the garden. So here's some people hard at work digging up the sod. The number one thing you do before you um, start digging in your garden is to call dig safe. So in some of these cases where you have maybe a 10 um, inch deep garden, it's important just to make sure that you're going to be digging in a place that's safe so you don't have a scary situation like is pictured there with that wire sticking up a live wire uh, with the dig safe. Once you've called dig safe and made sure that where you want to dig is safe, you can define the perimeter of the rain garden before starting. This makes the whole process a lot easier. Um, if, and this is, I'm sure, true for all kinds of gardens. If you just, especially if it's on um, a, an area that's already vegetated, just to make your life a little bit easier. So you define the perimeter of the rain garden. You might also want to um, kill the grass before excavating by laying down tarps or um, uh, anything for a couple of days or a few weeks even, um, just to make digging up the sod a little bit easier. As you dig up the sod, you can place the soil and the sod outside in the perimeter on three sides to create your berm. Um, berm is important on the downhill sides uh, so that you can create a little wall for the water to be held in. So this is sort of what that looks like. So this is the 
before digging, and then you would dig out all this, and then pile all the stuff that you dug out of here, and make your little berm on the downhill side so you can hold the water in the garden. You don't want it to flow right out like it would here. You also want to dig four to six inches deeper than you determined your depth of your garden to be, because once you excavate your garden, you'll be filling some of it back in with compost and sand and um, nice happy materials to both provide infiltration and make your plants healthy and large. So after the whole area is dug out, you want to um, lay a two by four board or some um, rigid board in the rain garden with a carpenter's level on top to find uneven sections and you level it with a garden rake. This is the most critical part about building a rain garden. It is probably the most um, dissimilar from building another kind of garden. If you don't do this, this step, your water is liable to flow into those low parts of your garden and you'll have saturated sections um, and really dry sections and then you know your plants won't be happy. So this is really important. You level it all out and make sure that the base of the garden, before you add any compost or mulch or sand back into it, that it's absolutely level. So the berm. So water obviously wants to flow downhill and the berm is built on three sides as a wall to hold the water in. It'll be highest on the downhill side if you have a slopey site and it can gradually taper off as it goes uphill. It should be well compacted soil, either gently sloped on the sides and seeded with grasses or you can use stone um, or other materials like that. Anything um, to create a decorative edge but that also holds in the water. So now for amending the soil. So you have your berm built and you have the bottom totally flat. You dug out the existing soil and then you want to add some fresh topsoil and compost and construction sand. The sand is because the, this garden you really want to be well drained. The purpose is that you're going to be directing water there and you want it to readily be able to infiltrate. There will be more water at this garden site than there would be at other gardens because you're actively directing water to this garden. So that's really important. This is one critical difference that I'm going to tell you right now that is different than what is in your rain garden manual. The best soil mixture for good drainage is 50% sand, 40% soil, and 10% low phosphorus compost. So I'm, this is different than what's in the rain garden manual because the rain garden manual says you should have more compost than this. Um, and a little less sand, and new research out of UVM at the bioretention lab that's in front of the Jeffords building on main campus, if you're familiar with that site, um, is indicating that if you put more compost in or if you spread the compost all over inside the garden, that you could also just be um, increasing the phosphorus loading or the nutrient loads either when the rain garden might overflow in the event of a, of a heavy rain or if you have a garden that's under drained um, because in some sites you may need an under drain and there's more details about that in the, gar in the rain garden manual. So if you have a lot of compost in there which has many nutrients in it then um, you could just be loading unnecessary nutrients into the stream and that's sort of counterproductive to what we're trying to get at. So these ratios are a little bit different so just more sand little more soil, less compost, and get low phosphorus compost if you can find it. Um, and consider adding the compost just around the plants as they establish um, because there will be some uh, nutrients in the water that you're directing there. Uh, and once the plants are established, they should be able to do fine. You want to mix the combination, that 50, 40, 10, um, in the hole using a shovel or a rototiller, get it all nice and mixed. And if you have native soils that are replaced partially or totally with these amended soils, um, you can still use those native soils for the berm. So in the case where maybe you have a really um, uh, a clay soil and you want to remove most of it because you need to get your infiltration uh, greater, you can still use those clay soils for the berm. So this is uh, when you start to, once you get all your um, soil in there and then you want to start planting your plants, you want to be really careful not to compact the soil while you're planting. One good technique is if you lay out some planks to distribute your weight um, throughout the garden and then walk on those plants instead of stepping all over that nice fluffy soil that you just put in there. So it's going to be really important that you have good infiltration and the more you walk all over those soils, you'll just eliminate that soil structure and the pore space in the soils. So laying a plank out is a good way to distribute your weight. And you want to water it just like any other garden after planting and for the first year so you can establish those healthy roots. So you wouldn't um, leave it up just to 
the water from your roof um, in the first year because the plants really need that uh, water regularly as they get those deep roots established. But after the first year, you shouldn't, be, shouldn't need to water it regularly anymore. So you plant all your plants, you did a good job making sure that you weren't smushing all that nice fluffy soil down. And then you want to add some mulch. It's important to inhibit the weed growth, especially while the garden is established. So this is probably pretty familiar to most of you. You'd want to choose a hardwood mulch over a bark mulch just to reduce the movement. So the bark mulch will be more likely to float during a rain event and then it can move the mulch all around your garden. But you could also use a pea gravel, um, which looks really attractive in these settings as well. Um, and it doesn't move around as much as any of those mulch choices. So now you've got the garden finished and you want to direct your water to the garden. So there's many different ways that this can look, and these are some examples on your screen. So you could dig a depressed grass trench or a stone line trench or a trench for an extender pipe uh, just to get the water from either the rooftop or the uh, driveway or wherever it is that you're directing water from or even just from a lawn. So it can be a sheet flow. It may not be a trench that you're directing it to um, or it can be any of these sort of alternative options. And you want to place stone at the garden entrance for where the water enters into the garden, especially if it's channelized and it isn't a sheet flow. It's not sort of accepting it all along one side of the garden if it's really channeled into one location because um, that'll reduce erosion at the entrance to the garden. And in a, in a large rain event, even if you have a small rooftop, you can really get a lot of water coming out the end of one of those, um, one of those drain pipes. So that's important. So this is an example. This is that same garden I've shown you a couple times. This is in uh, the north end of Burlington. So that's a, a rain barrel on the end of a standpipe of a house on the left-hand side of your screen. And then on the right-hand side, I showed that this rain barrel has this overflow hose. So the rain barrel, you know, in a rain event will fill up and it has this overflow hose that connects to the top of the rain barrel. And this homeowner buried this pipe, this overflow hose, and then has it running underneath the mulch and then it pops out right here and she lined here with gravel. So the water, it shoots out of here when it's a really big rain event, but it doesn't have an erosion at this site and it just moves the water from here sort of down over here into another section of the rain garden. So I thought that was kind of a clever way to do it and it looked really nice. But there's lots of examples for how you might do it. Okay, so now you're super excited about rain gardens and you want to build them everywhere. So if you do, these are some resources that you really need. The Vermont Rain Garden Manual. You can find it on the Sea Grant website, uvm.edu slash Grant. It's now in app form. Everything I talked about tonight is in that manual. Um, you also might want to know about the Let It Rain Stormwater Program. It's a cost share program through the Lake Champlain Sea Grant and the Winooski Conservation District. And you can apply to get assistance with your project. We'll come out to your site and help you figure out where to put a rain garden or a green roof or a permeable driveway um, or any number of other green infrastructural practices. You can get more information at letitrainvt.org. There's also the blue certification. It's from it's a program of Lake Champlain International. And they um, certify watershed friendly properties and they also offer incentive payments for people to install things like rain gardens. You can learn more about them at mychamplain.net slash blue program. And lastly, the LakeWise certification, this is specifically for shoreline property owners, lake shoreline property owners. And they're a certification program run through the Vermont Agency of Natural Resources. And they um, provide certification and incentive. Um, I don't actually, I don't know about the incentive. I think not incentive payments, but incentive um, technical support and the certification to install a number of lake-friendly practices, including rain gardens, if you live um, adjacent to a lake. I have one more thing to tell you before we close it up. Rain barrels and cisterns, a great way to collect um, rainwater, both to direct to your rain garden, but then also to use elsewhere on your property to collect um, runoff. It can be used in gardens during dry periods, and this is just another way to sort of slow that flow to the natural water bodies. They typically hold about 55 gallons, but if you want more capacity, you can consider a cistern, which are just large rain barrels, and you can, they'll also be embedded underground or um, as a, many different shapes and sizes and configurations of a cistern. Um, you can get more information on the Let It Rain website, um, or you can link multiple rain barrels together to get this, a similar effect. 
All right, now I'm going to open it up to uh, back to Heather, I guess, to take if there are any questions that I didn't capture. There are questions. I have a whole bunch of them now. All right. All right. Great. Um, does water runoff from a highway hurt the rain garden if you have it on your lawn? So if there's highway water runoff coming over that rain garden, will it hurt the, the plants in your rain garden, I'm assuming is the question. And I, I'm just going to assume, too, and if this isn't correct, whoever wrote that question, please just um, holler, um, I guess holler virtually with typing, <laughs> um, that, that the concern would be that the highway runoff has salt and gravel and hydrocarbons and other nasty things in it. And if that's the case, it, the answer is no, in that if you pick the if you pick plants, they're tolerant to harsh conditions. You shouldn't have a problem. But of course, there are some cases where if you have really high salt concentrations, there are few plants that won't um, have, struggle to survive in those cases. Um, and so, if you have really harsh influent water coming into your garden, one way to manage that is to have what's called a four bay. And so it's really just a, um, an area that's like a pre-garden. So you'd have like a little garden without any plants in it. It might just have, uh, it might just be, um, uh, what's the word, grass? <laughs> yeah, or gravel. Um, so that the water can first come in there and it settles out a lot of the large particles. So you'd get rid of some of your salts. Um, and if you had a lot of debris or a lot of sand in there um, and heavy debris, so then you wouldn't get all of that going into your garden. Okay, next question. Are there rain garden designs that have been applied to dairy farms? Yes, I'm, that's a fantastic question. That's super exciting because there's some research going on at UVM right now. They're installing the plants this year um, at the Vermont, at the UVM uh, dairy farm on Spear Street. And they have three large a bioretention, bioretention is just another word for a rain garden, and they're testing um, three different configurations, both with and without plants, um, and it's a simple switchgrass variety because trying to keep with what the maintenance requirements would be from a farm, um, and they're testing what the removal rates will be for phosphorus from these uh, couple of um, designs. It's not a common thing to call them rain gardens when they're on large scale. It's more commonly referred to as bioretention. And farm runoff tends to be managed using different BMPs, best management practices. But this particular, we'll have, you know, we have research going on right here at UVM, so we'll have data um, on that application at the end of the summer. Beautiful. Can you comment on yeah. the can you comment on the installation of permeable pavers and their benefits? Yeah, sure. Permeable pavers are great. They're another green infrastructural practice, and. Um, Permeable pavers are one of a suite of permeable uh, material for driving or walking on. So there's also permeable asphalt and permeable concrete. Um, they're effective in that they provide a conduit for water to infiltrate into the ground rather than run off of it. There are challenges associated with those um, depending on the practice that you use, and there's also particular maintenance considerations that you would want to consider. So permeable pavers are like, um, they look like uh, like bricks, but in between them they have a aggregate where water can flow through and infiltrate. Um, but that, just like any surface, needs to be maintained. So there's a uh, practice for vacuuming up that uh, and cleaning out the aggregate in between the bricks on a regular basis. You just want to be sure that when you use any permeable paving option that you don't, aren't collecting water for running onto it from another land use. In other words, only water that falls on that parking lot or driveway or walkway should be the water that infiltrates into those pavers. You shouldn't be directing water from a grassy, grassy area. Research has shown that they tend to clog more when you do that. Okay, can you suggest a source for low P compost? I wish I could, this is an easy, I wish this was an easy question. Um, no, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> the, so um, we're working on it, though. Uh, there's an interest, and um, there's many of us in Vermont who are hoping that we can get a reliable source locally. Um, none of the Vermont-based compost suppliers are providing truly low P compost right now. Um, 
we the the project that I just mentioned that are that's at the hort, at the farm on Spear Street at UVM, they're using a low P compost blend, and they had it sent up here from Rhode Island, um, w which is the closest place they could find it. If you're just looking for a lower P, the best you can get, you can uh, if you call Green Mountain Compost. I believe they offer what they're calling is a lower P, but it's not a truly low P. But um, but we're working on it with some suppliers of compost and hope that within the next year there'll be a reliable regular source. Okay, next question. Um, this is regarding the Let It Rain and the Blue Certification programs. Are there any such programs in Wyndham County? Yeah, all, all of those. Pro uh, actually, I want to. I don't know that. Uh, I don't know if Blue is in Wyndham County, but Let It Rain is a statewide program. So yes, yay for Wyndham County. Yes. Is there any program for assistance if your land borders a river? And this is uh, she lives in Lamoille. Oh yeah, um, not not specifically if your land borders a river, but the Let It Rain program and the Blue Certification program are irrespective of what your land borders. Uh, so you can take advantage of that. It's just that there isn't like a, a lake-wise for rivers program, but you can take advantage of the other programs, uh, whether you're next to a river or next to anything else. Okay, I rent a house without gutters. Are there good options or alternatives for rain barrels, which I'd really like to use to water my garden? Oh. An alternative to a rain barrel if you don't have gutters. Uh, it's hard to collect the water, as I'm sure you already know, um, if you don't have a gutter, if it's just coming over the end of a drip edge. In some cases, though, if you have a 90-degree um, a angle, you know, where, the, where two roofs come together and it sort of has a channel, in many cases, those channels are, you, if you, you could just put a bucket under that and you can collect all kind, tons of water from that. Um, so if you have that situation, I would suggest just putting a rain barrel under it, and you can attach what's called a, a rain chain. Uh, so it's a way to just sort of like slow the water down as it enters the rain barrel. You just hook it onto the um, the edge of the roof um, at that location. It slows the water down so it's not sort of barreling into the barreling into the barrel, um, but just slows it down and makes it trickle so it flows into the barrel. If you don't have that kind of a situation, you may still uh, uh, from any point on your drip edge, still be able to get enough to collect it into to the barrel. One suggestion would be you could flare the top of the barrel out with like a large, uh, sort of make a large funnel, um, so you're making the mouth of the barrel bigger and you can direct more water into it. Um, you would be surprised, I think, about the amount, the volume of water that comes off of even a modest size roof. So to fill up a 55 gallon bucket, um, you don't need to get all of the runoff from your roof into it. So just try and put it at the drip edge and see what you can collect. Okay, what about directing water from non-permeable asphalt to permeable pavers? Is that okay? No. <laughs> that was easy. <laughs> that was great. No, yeah, it, it's, um, it's not. I mean, the newest research out of the Stormwater Center in, in, at UNH, where they, they study these things extensively, and what they found is that you just increase the chances of it clogging much sooner. And because the maintenance can be onerous, if you have to do it more often than the manufacturer's recommendation, um, it, you, know, you, just, you just have to maintain it a lot more, and it clogs more. Uh, it's more readily clogging. So you want the water that falls on those pavers to be uber clean. And the cleanest water is what is falling on it directly from the sky. If you start directing water or if water's flowing onto it from a impermeable surface, you're, you're bound to get gravel and grit and salt and sand and uh, all kinds of stuff. And then it ends up in that aggregate in between your pavers and it just clogs really quickly. Okay, and this is the last question that I have for now. Um, is this an urban concept? I'm having a hard time applying this to my 20 plus acres of upland land. Yeah, um, that's a great point. Uh, and it's been the focus of the green infrastructure movement, I guess, 
uh, across the country is to focus it on urban landscapes. And I can see how if you have a lot of land, you might think, gee, this doesn't really apply to me. And maybe this type of rain garden doesn't apply to you. Maybe you have so much land and there's so much vegetation that doing a rain garden might be sort of a lot of work for minimal benefit. But there are other green infrastructure practices and um, I guess tenants that you can apply to larger sites. And those are things like leaving grass high, um, planting trees, really anything that is restoring the hydrology that was there before you put a driveway and a house on that site. And so it can be rain gardens, but it can be a lot of other things like reestablishing a meadow, um, planting large old growth trees, um, you know, sow, sowing plants around. So if you have the space for it and you have a, a smaller developed area, like you just have a driveway and a rooftop, um, then you can do other things. One thing to point out, though, is that driveways in rural areas are major, they can be major sources of sediment and major sources of volume. And so carefully designing a driveway so that it pitches or is crowned so that it flows off the sides of the driveway and doesn't barrel down to the end so that it gets into ditches and the stormwater infrastructure um, is important and that the water as it flows off of that driveway or off your rooftop is infiltrated adjacent to the driveway. Um, it, it gets at the same principles. You're just trying to infiltrate that water that would have been infiltrated if you never moved there. That's all. Okay, I think we're going to have to stop there. So I'd like to thank you, Becky, so much for presenting for us tonight. And I want to let everyone know that Becky's presentation will be posted on our website. Some of you will be going on to having a project presentation this evening. I think there are three chapters that are doing that. For those of you who aren't having the project night tonight, there will be project nights set up, and I'll keep you posted when I receive more information from the local chapters. So if you don't have that, there is a uh, next next steps video that I've recorded for people on how to go on to become certified as a master gardener. I would recommend watching that this evening. And also this is a fantastic time to work on the National Plant Diagnostic Network modules. So I hope that you enjoyed this evening's presentation and I hope those of you who are having project night tonight have a wonderful evening. Thanks again.